Uh, we are very, very fortunate to have with us Father from Boston, <coughs> who will share his wisdom and insights on the topic of university ethics. His presentation, like the title of one of his recent books, is University Ethics, How Colleges Can Build and Benefit from a Culture of Ethics. So we decided to put that to uh, before introducing Father Jim Keenan, I would like to say a few words about what led us at the Bioethics Institute to select this particular topic for our fall lecture. The idea is in fact the result of a broad convergence of interests and events at our university, one that has taken shape over at least the past three years. It began as a public reflection on the mission and identity of the Renew, spawned by issues of healthcare coverage for abortion, I'm sure you remember, and it progressively grew into a larger conversation about many topics, including benefits for contingent faculty, the overall status of adjuncts at the university, and the role of the treatment of staff, among others. For sure, many positive changes have ensued as a result of this public reflection, but of course, much work is still to be done. I would be remiss if I fail to mention in this regard the generous and tireless effort of two people, and I want to mention them publicly, Professor Anna Harrison from Theological Studies and Dr. Elizabeth Kiros from Bioethics, who inspired many of us to pursue the conversation on the fairness and justice of very new practices across the board. They have worked very hard to prepare this event tonight. In classic Jesuit fashion, one could say that their efforts have set the world on fire. Well, what could this be? I'm sorry, Anna Harrison, do but set the world on fire. Inspiring others, students, faculty, staff, and administrators to join in a larger conversation. Father Keenan's book has served as a perfect catalyst and guide in that reflection. And uh, since last spring, a reading group has gathered to talk about university ethics, to explore the nuances of various topics, and to see their relevance for our own situation here. So, our event tonight comprises two parts, the lecture of Father Jim Keenan and three responses from a student, a staff, and a faculty member, respectively. Professor Harrison will moderate the panel, so I will leave it up to her to introduce the speakers. There will be also a session. Um, so, let me now introduce the speaker. Father Jim Keenan. Father Keenan is Canisius Professor of Boston College and the director of the Jesuit Institute. A moral theologian by training, he is possibly the most respected, respected Catholic ethicist in the US, please that's how I see, and a highly regarded scholar worldwide. His scholarship is immense and it is defined by many interests. The author of 20 books and literally hundreds of scholarly articles. He has addressed a vast array of questions spanning foundational issues in ethics, theological method and theory, historical sources of moral theology, as well as issues in applied ethics, bioethics, pastoral theology, and spirituality. So his CV is an outstanding tour de force, reaching of late the respectable size of 54 pages. And I was also told that, as it stands now, there is may need some update. So I don't know when it <laughs> sleeps. Uh, in addition to being a prolific academic, Father Keenan is also what I would call an ecclesial and public intellectual. With regular publications in general periodicals, such as America Magazine, Common Weed, the Tablet, and others, he is an opinion maker in the best sense of the word, defining with the clarity and precision of a truly analytic thinker the most difficult ethical issues of the day at the intersection of church and society. So I'm sure you will appreciate tonight his wisdom, 
love his sense of humor, and enjoy the depth of his ethical sensibility. He's a real honor and a great thing for our university to have here, Father Jim. is that I had, as a priest teaching in Boston, uh, let alone moral theology, I became very much involved in the sex abuse crisis in, in Boston. I became recruited uh, to say what was going on, but I began to look at it as a moral theologian, seeing beyond uh, the obvious uh, wrongfulness and looking more at the structural issues that allowed this to happen and it, for it to be actually promoted in a variety of ways, and um, that made me aware of the fact that one of the two major institutions that teach ethics was deeply flawed in training its own personnel in e ethics. That is, that the church taught ethics, but not to their personnel, their priests, their bishops, their administrators, both lay and clergy. And, um, as that was happening, and we were kind of like, then with Cardinal O'Malley coming and things were changing a bit, um, at the same time, I began to ask questions, well, how's the university doing? And I began to ask, is the other institution that teaches ethics, is it ethical in its practices? Two things happened that changed me. One, I'll mention it in this story in a moment. One was Sean Copeland. I had written, a, uh, I had edited a collection of essays on, um, on ethics and the church. And I had asked uh, 25 people to contribute, uh, but Sean contributed one about ethics in the university. And it was the first time I ever saw anything like it. And the second is Frank Clooney, a good friend of mine. When B Boston College came up with this thing of Church 21, he said, you know, Boston College shouldn't do Church 21. It should do University 21. We need somebody to raise the questions about the university that we're raising about the church. These things were always in the back of my mind, and I began to look at the university and look like there were so many things happening at the university. There was sexual assault. There, there were racially themed parties by students. There was the glass ceiling for gender. There was adjunct faculty. There was runaway tuition. There was, you know, um, uh, athletes who were not getting an education and being taken advantage of. There were board of trustee members who had deep conflicts of interest. Um, and I went through, there were professors sleeping with their students. There was cheating. There was plagiarism. I kept coming up with things. And the one thing is that every time anyone wrote about these issues, none of them pointed to the one thing that they all had in common, the university. Is there something about the university that it can generate all these scandals? And though there are about 25 books on, there's one called The Lecherous Professor, there's things uh, about the ivory tower, there's all these different critiques, say, of faculty, but there's nothing sustained about the university. I live in a community with three 
um, Jesuit, oh, two Jesuits and a Franciscan, all of whom are also ethicists. David Hollenbach, a social ethicist. Um, Ken Himes, a, a Franciscan who is athletic and, um, and interested in ethics. And then John Paris, who has an opinion on everything. And these three guys, I told them that I had this argument that no one was raising the question, say about sexual assault, that, on a, university camp, that a university campus is the most dangerous place in America for a 20-year-old woman. Now, does anybody want to write about the university or just about sexual assault on the university? Um, or race, for instance. Think about race. Um, do you know that there have been studies done that when a, before a student enters a university, they have a rather strong interest in learning about racial diversity. At the end of their freshman year, they have less of an interest. And by the beginning of their fourth year, their interest has really kind of leveled off. In other words, if you have interest in racial diversity to try to understand how races can come together, don't go to a university because they will let you develop into all those assumptions that were never analyzed by anyone else and that allowed you to go into self-selecting ways. And all these studies have been done beforehand, it's just they were never read or practiced. And I began to keep looking at this and each day when I would come down to breakfast, my three brothers, two Jesuits and one Franciscan would say, Jimmy, do you see about the hazing incident at Florida? Do you see about the president of the university who got sacked by an illicit board? Do you see about the racial theme party at this place? Do you see about every day I had, and that's what's really wonderful about universities, if you're interested in university ethics, there's so much out there to work with. So that when I did the book, I had to make sure that everything was in the public forum so I could substantiate it. And any of you who've read the book know that it's engaging. <laughs> So now let me say something, let me turn now to this thesis of mine, that we have to ask why it is that the university generates so much scandal, and why no one thinks the way they did about the church. They, everybody questioned the integrity of the church. No one, no one questions the integrity of the university. It's just not done. We question the integrity of the church, but not of the university. So why? I want to offer two reasons that I think uh, is problematic. In 2008, and here I'm going to turn to my book. Um, in 2008, I was invited to deliver a plenary presentation at the 2009 annual convention of the Catholic Theological Society of America. The title was Impasse and Theological Ethics, and if anyone knows anything about the field of Catholic theological ethics, they would have presumed that the impasse I intended to address was that between bishops and theological ethicists. When I received the invitation, I was at the beginning of a 14-month cancer therapy for a stage three melanoma that included major surgery, two significant infections, and 12 months of maximum dosage on interferon. In the light of this experience, I decided, contrary to expectations, to reflect on my experience of encountering impasse in my illness and how that impasse taught me to embrace solidarity with others. During the talk, I reflected for a moment on whether where we teach and work, the university itself promotes solidarity. I went in this direction because a colleague of mine, Sean Copeland, had awakened in me a suspicion about the university and its culture. Ten years earlier, while editing with the Mennonite ethicist Joe Kotfer, a collection of essays on church ministerial ethics, we received from Copeland an essay not about the church but about the university, entitled Collegiality as a Moral and Ethical Practice. She wrote about a young black woman theologian who finds her white colleagues are as strikingly naive about their privilege as they are about her own challenges. Copeland focused not only on their self-understanding, but also on the isolating character of our training and our working in the academy. I had never seen an essay on university culture and ethical issues before, 
nor thought about the isolationist culture of our workplace. While the essay remained in the back of my mind for years, it came full forward as I was preparing my talk on impasse and solidarity. The more I considered the university, the more I recognized how right Copeland was. Unlike most professionals and civil servants, we in the faculty function very much as individuals. Aside from department meetings, we study alone, work alone, teach alone, write alone, and lecture alone. We also grade students individually and write their singular letters of recommendation. We cannot underestimate the individualism of our scholarly formation and our professional lifestyle. While almost every contemporary professional works in some form of partnership or teamwork, police officers with their partners, firefighters with their ladder companies, healthcare workers with their team, lawyers with their firm, we faculty train alone and then work virtually alone. Think of the dissertation. What other field of work requires its professional formation to be at least five years of working alone on one's own project with the last two years spent effectively in solitary confinement? Why is this the highest expression of academic wisdom so individualistic and so isolationist. Someone might say, yes, but there is mentoring. However, even the relationality and the mentoring is not terribly thick. How many hours during those four, five, six years, I clocked that as 35,040 hours, 43,800 hours, or if you take six years to do your dissertation, that was 52,560 hours. How many of those hours were spent miss meeting your advisor? Is it at all analogous to other professional relationships where juniors literally shadow their mentor? I began to see that the isolationism and attendant lack of solidarity makes us dull in our sensitivity to matters within the academy that we should be critiquing. Nowhere is this more clear than in our lack of knowledge about the working conditions of our colleagues, the adjunct faculty, who, as we will see in a moment, function sometimes as indentured servants at our universities. One interesting corollary to the highly individualistic world we work in is found in the university's prescription that we write with a detached, inaccessible, frigid, and dense style. An emotionally detached place like the academy trains us to be wary of writing anything accessible to others outside our field because it would be popular, because it, would co it could compromise the style of professorial reputation. Martin Anderson describes well academic publishing. An academic book or a scholarly article is not expected to sell many copies nor appeal to many people outside a select intellectual circle. Thus isolated, the typical academic intellectual operates freely, uninhibited by the judgment of others, subject only to the verdict of colleagues who judge, whose themselves are judged by the same narrow criteria. There is um, here a deep disconnect then that I believe exists between what and how the faculty teach and how we actually live. In a recent essay reflecting on how tenure-line faculty are responding to the rise of adjuncts, Robin Wilson reports on how many tenured faculty are fighting to retain their own control. Solidarity with adjuncts is very far from their minds, she writes. Wilson adds, tenured professors frequently want it both ways. As one faculty member explained, these faculty bemoan contingent professors' poor pay, lack of job security, and the meager respect they get on campuses. But at the same time, they are circling the wagons, refusing to put their non-tenure track colleagues on equal footing by giving them full seats in the faculty senate. It's the whole, we are elite and privileged, and we want to talk about the downtrodden. That's Wilson. Wilson quotes another faculty member, this time an adjunct. 
The great hypocrisy of higher education right now is that many professors who teach Marxist theory turn around and just perpetuate their tiered labor structures that theoretically they'd be completely against. Certainly, many faculty have great relationships with a variety of members of the university. My argument, however, is that professionally speaking, there is not a structure that promotes those relationships. Teaching, grading, and mentoring is measured against singular professionals. But it is not just in those areas of university work that we as standalone individuals. Think, for instance, of office hours. What other professional corporate life lets their employees come to work whenever they want to? I, I'm friends with um, Marsh Carter. He was the um, CEO of the New York Stock Exchange and before that the CEO of State Street. He teaches occasionally at Boston College at CSOM, at the, at the, um, at the, uh, the uh, School of Management, Carroll School of Management. And he said, it's really remarkable but I come from the stock exchange. Everybody talks to everybody. And I see this all over in, in the financial world. I go to a university and all I see are individual faculty members in their office alone, if they're there. <laughs> Other than the classes we teach and occasionally the monthly department meetings we may have to attend, most faculty can choose to arrive for any offices we want. Not only are we free to name our office hours, but there is rarely an expectation to host office hours during any specific time that would be convenient for other people, like our students. By office hours, we are required to be available to another person, presumably a student in need, yet we can set those hours whenever we want, and rarely are we required to be there in the office for more than four or five hours a week. What other professional has such autonomy? Note, I'm not suggesting that faculty only have four hours of work. With teaching, letters of recommendation, publishing, and other academic demands, many faculty have a full week of work. But that work is on our time, our place, and again, usually alone. Hardly any other modern professional works this way. If we should want to teach with another colleague, then what? What machinery does the university have to accommodate such a design? What credit do we get for teaching with another? What credit do we get if we teach with another from another department, or worse, another school? What if we write with another? Will we receive full credit for the scholarship, for the authorship? Certainly, all these matters can be rectified. But for now, as it has been historically for the past four, 800 years, one's teaching, writing, mentoring, and one's evaluation as faculty has usually defaulted to being singularly accountable agent. Still, we should, not, we should be able to see that if individual faculty took the initiative to enter into practices of solidarity with others, this could lead to the possibility of developing and sustaining an ethical community within the university. When faculty elect to join a seminar, volunteer to be on a university committee, offered to be the faculty advisor of a student club, or host their class at their home with a meal. They enter relation, into relationships that make possible community. But these turns to the practices of solidarity are themselves ethics turns to ethical practices. With ethics, community can flourish. Without ethics, the community breaks down. When we ask, how can tenure-line faculty who know that there are adjunct faculty at the university actually not think about their colleagues' piecework existence, we should not only turn to the faculty's individualism and their own myopia as an explanation, we need also to consider the social landscape of the university. In fact, asking faculty questions about why they don't know about the conditions of the adjunct it's like asking faculty if they know where their students live, where their students, whether their students have received merit or need-based scholarships, or which students might have been hospitalized or arrested over the weekend. Most faculty only know about such issues incidentally. As Julie Rubin notes, 
With reforms of the 1890s, faculty effectively withdrew institutionally from concerns about their students' private lives. 1890 is when the Ivies decide to take the entire question of student formation and assign it to a different professional base and to take it out of the hands of the faculty at the Ivies. And the rest of America followed the Ivies in time. The faculty's ignorance in either instance is explained by their own individual way of working and the blinders they wear as they go from their office to their classes, but also by the social contours of the university that does not foster community, friendship, or solidarity, but rather departmentalizes personnel groupings routinely. Faculty would not only be in the dark about their adjunct colleagues and their own students, they would also not know much about faculty salaries, either those in their departments or in other departments. And unless they read the Chronicle of Higher Education, they would not know salaries that one makes at other universities in comparable departments doing comparable work. Just as faculty do not know much about students, adjunct faculty, or other salaries, neither do university employees know much about others at the so-called university. Plant managers, cafeteria workers, student affairs deans, financial aid offices, admissions boards, custodial workers, trustee members, campus ministers, university police, and librarians each have their own definable domain, and their members know mostly what happens within that domain. Rarely are there occasions to go beyond one's domain except when they go to university sporting events. The university might think of itself as a community, but it's a thin one at best. Any reading of the literature on the life of the university tells us that the university structure is very clear in its vertical direction. Each cluster knows without a doubt who answers to whom in the upwardly oriented structure of unilateral accountability. The geography of the American university horizontally is not terribly clear. However, because its terrain is defined by clusters or domains unto themselves. I think that the university horizontal structure is best understood by fiefdoms, a perfect description of the university in as much as both are deeply rooted in the medieval world. More, moreover, structurally, fiefdoms, like universities are not related horizontally, except at the top. The more I looked to see who else was writing about fiefdoms at the university, the more I found other metaphors used to describe the on-the-ground culture of the university. Private business corporations, organized anarchies, there's some fabulous essays, organized anarchies and the university. But my two favorite, other than fiefdoms, are the caste system, and the best is drug gangs. Try, try to explain wh why somebody who's doing a, a doctorate um, decides that they're really going to be that snowflake that gets that job that no one else can get. And then think of drug gangs, and how many people think, I can become a drug lord if only I can figure it out. There's this one Englishman who wrote a big, long blog about this, and everybody got on it and said, the perfect explanation for grad school is drug gangs. But I like fiefdoms. It helps capture the social contours of the university that lacks a culture of ethics. I believe that the university, stemming as it does from the medieval era, is affected structurally by its roots. Not only does its hierarchical structure make its accountability flow unilaterally and singularly vertically, but also inherits the geography of fiefdoms that hinder matters not only of accountability and transparency, but also of relationality, distributive justice, and the common good. Fiefdoms are a university trademark evident in two ways. First, as we have seen, its major employees, the faculty, work alone. Teaching remains, even in the 21st century, a fairly singular affair. The academy's vocational and professional structure is a fairly medieval identity, much like Abelard's, though it is hard to find anyone else in most other contemporary corporate professions interested in emulating Abelard. Just think of it. We're the only ones who want to emulate Abelard. 
continued on that reflection for a while. <laughs> Second, universities are organized by departments, a structure that gives the suggestion that each department shares something in common with another. But given the hierarchical structures of the university, such I shared identity functions less in the operations and more in the purported mission design. Departments are part of the fiefdom structure, in part because higher level administrators can treat departments differently without others in other departments knowing anything differently. In fact, in many ways, these administration as administrators function as feudal lords. Life within the department is determined much less by what happens in other departments as by what happens between senior administrators and that department. At universities, at least the administrators know that knowledge is power. In fact, the Chronicle of Higher Education recently published a compelling essay about how much departments differ from each other precisely because the make or break element for each department is the chair. Despite the fact that the more managerial expertise is required of the chair, again, like their own administrative superiors, academics believe that they can assume leadership positions without any managerial training. Moreover, more department chairs are being asked to do fundraising, and this new development, they tend to represent more and more the dean they serve. Their responsibilities become less and less connected with other chairs, and more with the deans of the schools in which their specific department is housed. Everything is vertical. Fiefdoms are not only in the academic sector, but in the student affairs life as well. Just as faculty might not know the student's personnel conduct, neither does student affairs know the student's academic life. Similarly, health and counseling services, development, alumni relations, athletics, dining services, and many other departments function separately and are accountable to the different university managers who make their own assessments according to their specific domain's criteria. This is at a place that calls itself a community. It doesn't call itself, you know, Goldman Sachs. It calls itself a university. Uh, in short, the standard communications and information of each domain are not set across the university itself, but are particular to and remain within the domain of the specific fiefdom. It is for this reason that the only two constituencies who know what occurs across the university are the clients, that is, the students and the president. At the university, other than the president, only the student knows what they can get from whom. This is a knowledge set that neither faculty, counselors, librarians, nor development enjoy or show an interest in. Still, though they know what is available, the student would not know anything about the actual effectiveness of any particular domain except anecdotally. Vice presidents in their cabinet meetings with the president share their information with one another. The hermeneutics of one's own domain standards are explained and understood. Reports across domains are gathered, shared, and assessed. With the president, the vice presidents have an overall sense of the corporate community, but the sharing of information across the university has not happened anywhere near the ground where most university employees work, for there is no such transparency or accountability at the university, at least horizontally. In short, aside from meetings of the president's cabinet and some general reporting at trustees' meetings, the university does not promote the sharing of standards information or goals particular to any department or domain. Similarly, there are few structures, policies, or practices that are in any way designed to fortify any relationality among any of the providers of any of the services at the university. In terms of ethics, this is fairly problematic because we know from Aristotle there is some relationship between the polis or the actual community and the common good that makes possible human flourishment. That is, to the extent that members of the polis as a society participate in and contribute to the common good, there is human flourishment. But at the university, the players on the ground do not see a coherency in the community, nor an operative notion of the common good. The bureaucracy of the university does not have an internal horizontal structure of engagement, nor are there any inbuilt structures of horizontal accountability within the university. Worse still, the bureaucracy of the university shows no sign of checking itself, continues expanding, and eventually is no longer sustainable. All these challenges prompt us to ask, 
how can we op uh, overcome the obstacles to good community and provide a sharing of the common good? So let me turn to one of my topics. In my book, I have 10 topics I work on, race, gender, athletics, uh, commodification, uh, cheating, a great chapter on cheating at Harvard. It was wonderful. Ch Harvard provided me a year-long expose of their cheating scandals, and they were fabulous. Uh, but this, I want to say something is about adjunct faculty. In my 13 years at my university, Boston College, I have been working on faculty development mentoring junior tenure-track faculty and developing programs for graduate students, from advising and mentoring to developing a culture of teaching formation in our doctoral program. Still, in my, diver my university and in my department, there are adjuncts. Until I wrote my book, I knew next to nothing about them. And as I researched more and more, I realized that the gulf between tenured faculty and adjunct faculty has few secure ways of passage connecting us. I knew little about their terms of employment. Like other tenured faculty, I unconsciously, but conveniently, wore blinders about their work and their conduct, context. I managed to tell myself they do not concern me. They do, but I managed to tell myself otherwise. While writing my book, an adjunct who is also a journalist in Boston, Lisa Liberty Becker, asked to interview me because she is writing on adjunct faculty and heard that I was writing a book on university ethics. In the course of the interview, she concurred that I had a pretty good handle on the issues that adjuncts face. But before we descended into the details, she asked me an important question. What do you know about adjunct at your own institution? Next to nothing, I replied. I have managed to tell myself that they do not concern me. Then I added, I'm acting chair next semester. Assuredly, I will find out. I say this simply to let the tenure line faculty get some space to acknowledge that they probably conveniently do not care about adjuncts. There is within the university structure a cultural myopia that allows us to not think about the adjuncts. It is the fault of the structure of the university, but it's also our fault as well. Take this test. Imagine for a moment as a tenured faculty member, and this is, a, this is one of those nightmares we, in our anxiety pool, uh, come up with. You learn that your university president is about to declare an end to sabbaticals, tenure, and academic freedom, the three big ones. I imagine that the tenured faculty would be up in arms and would argue rightly that these changes would threaten the nature of the university the pivotal role of critical inquiry in the classroom, and the fundamental need to protect intellectual rigor and investigation. They would also expect one another to stand in solidarity together as fellow teachers committed to the very vocation of serving the university community. Eventually, we would think of those more vulnerable than us, the junior tenure-track faculty. <laughs> Just imagine the impassioned claims we would hear from one another about our interest in protecting the futures of our junior tenure track faculty. That self-understanding that could galvanize tenured faculty to think of one another and to think of junior tenure track faculty does not make it to our minds as we learn about the many threats to the contingent faculty. They may be threatened, but we are not. Surely, we are both faculty, but our understanding of our ethical responsibilities somehow conveniently end with those tenured and those following us on a tenure track. But let me say something more about their situation. This, in 2010, the American Federation of Teachers produced the first survey of part-time adjunct faculty. It provides some of the fundamental data that we need to understand the situation. The report begins with these words. Most Americans would be surprised to learn that almost three quarters of the people employed today to teach undergraduate courses in the nation's colleges and universities are not full-time uh, permanent professors, tenured track or tenured, but rather instructors employed on limited term contracts to teach anything from one course to a full course load. These instructors, most of whom on a part-time basis, now teach the majority of undergraduate courses in US public colleges and universities. 
Altogether, part-time adjunct faculty members account for 47% of all faculty, not including graduate employees. The percentage is even higher in community colleges with part-time adjunct faculty representing nearly 70% of the instructional, instructional workforce in those institutions. The survey came up with three summary insights. First, part-time adjunct instructors are generally pleased to have teaching jobs and enjoy teaching. That's the first. Second, part-time adjunct faculty members vary considerably in the extent of their participation in the institution, as well as their ambitions to teach on a full-time basis. Third, the survey highlights serious shortcomings in the financial and professional support by part-time adjunct uh, instructors. Regarding the second point, they note that part-time adjunct faculty, part-time and other adjunct faculty members are about evenly split between those who prefer working part-time and those who would like to have full-time jobs. About 46% of the respondents have previously sought full-time college teaching employment. Differences surface repeatedly in the survey between those who aspire to full-time teaching jobs and those who do not. In other words, half of the adjunct faculty are content with their present positions and half are not. There is widespread concern, though, among this part-time and adjunct faculty about bread and butter conditions. About 57% of the survey respondents say that their salaries are falling short. Only 28% indicate that they receive health insurance on the job. Only 39% say they have retirement benefits through their employment. <coughs> Pardon me. Besides their alienation and isolation resulting from inadequate salaries, benefits, and institutional support, Four other noteworthy considerations help us to understand the predicament of adjunct faculty. First, tenure track and tenured faculty, as well as departmental chairs, simply take for granted the secondary status of adjunct faculty. Um, Janet Casey, in a soul-searching essay, tries to fathom how tenure line faculty, who engendered a variety of um, political movements uh, concerning race and gender, are unable to significantly raise their own voices of concern for colleagues who are adjuncts, especially when repeatedly tenure-line faculty have been identified as the participants most needed for real potential game-changing. She writes, I believe that the failure of most tenure-track faculty members to attend seriously to non-tenure-track issues has far less to do with self-absorption than with a tendency to see contingent labor use, abuse, as merely an employment or market economics issue, rather than a problem framed by questions of social justice and academic freedom. Viewing contingency hiring purely as a market issue, of course, allows us to dismiss it as something largely beyond our control. Viewing it in reference to social justice and academic freedom, however, makes it continuous with earlier struggles in the academy and suggests that the problem must be resolved by those within the system. Second, absurd as it may seem, inasmuch as cost-cutting led to adjunct faculty, further cost-cutting procedures at universities often right, run right to the adjunct faculty. A clear indication of this is that universities faced with the Affordable Care Act recognize that 30 hours of work um, uh, constitutes full-time employment and therefore healthcare benefits have quickly lowered the number of hours for part-time adjunct faculty. Third, the civil liberties of adjunct faculty are unclear. Inasmuch as tenure and academic freedom go hand in hand, academic protection for ac adjunct faculty is not in evidence. Just as recruiting and hiring adjunct faculty often happen on the spot, so too does the suspending, firing, or refusing to renew contract happen without any scrutiny or transparency. Fourth, the construction of adjunct faculty is simply not sustainable. As Harvest Moon, a, a blog writer, well describes what led to her decision to leave her adjunct career. 
I took a hard look at the facts, 2,500 per course, no health coverage, no job security, no unemployment insurance. Then I considered the likelihood that my circumstances would never improve. It was difficult to admit to myself that, if anything, my real earnings would likely continue to decline even as my expenses increased. The word that came to my mind was unsustainable. It was a pivotal moment. To conclude, there are major innovation designs to respond to the conditions of these adjuncts. Three organizations worth checking out is the Adjunct Project, the Delphi Project, and the New Faculty Majority. The approach of each is fairly distinctive, and they each complement one another rather well. The development of adjunct faculty at any university is related to supplementing the tenure-track faculty that university policies regarding adjunct faculty are in many instances sui generis. So this data allows people to see something that normally can't be known. The adjunct project, for instance, is a listing of the salaries of individual courses according to the departments and schools at each of the listed 3,852 colleges. This is an enormous help to adjunct faculty to see what the schools are offering. The Delphi Project is a wide array of interested parties seeking to better communications among interested parties while advancing the narrative of the adjunct faculty situation so as to remedy their lack of equity, their exclusion from the university campus, and their impediments to educational resources. The, um, among the guidelines that the new faculty majority offer is a vision of future professoriate. In the place of the present three-tiered system, tenure track um, and tenured, full-time non-tenure track and part-time non-tenure track, that is a difference of three kinds of professoriate, the authors present one professoriate that is differentiated by, uh, by varying degrees of shared responsibilities. In their drafting of the project with an array of stakeholders, they came to agree on many common principles for this one professoriate. In other words, give to all professors the same rights and responsibilities. Um, and the ones they gave in, um, was academic freedom, shared governance, a livable wage, and greater job security for non-tenure track faculty in the form of multi-year contracts. There was also agreement that teaching and scholarship cannot be fully unbundled, that institutional roles should differ by institutional type, and that above all, student success should be the primary focus of any faculty work. They conclude their guidelines recognizing the need to learn to trust each other in order to address this problem. So I want to give an ethical proposal. It should be obvious at this point that the plight of the adjunct needs a variety of approaches, and clearly the initiatives ought not to be reduced to one. But that being said, adjuncts are alienated at a place called the university, a place that the Encyclopedia Britannica refers to as a community of teachers and scholars. That's what the university is defined as, a community of teachers and scholars. Is that what you think? It's a community of teachers and scholars. Not only that, but these alienated individuals are the new faculty majority. Something deeply unsettling about the university appears when we turn to the adjunct situation, but also when we turn to them in light of an ethical inquiry into the university, their situation becomes even more striking. Um, here I want to conclude by offering my own ethical proposal to my colleagues so that we can expand our own circle of who constitutes the meritorious title of colleague. The foundations of most ethical systems are based on the shoring up of particular relationships. For Aristotle, the virtue of friendship is a mainstay for the common good, not only a necessary thing, but a splendid one, he calls it. He writes, friendship is the bond that holds the community together. And lawmakers seem to attach more significance to it than justice, because concord seems to be something like friendship. And concord is their primary object. Um, because concord seems to be something like friendship. And concord is their primary object. That uh, an eliminating faction, which is enmity, that has as an eliminating faction enmity. 
He identifies it not only as a feeling, but as a state, as an activity. Friendship is not a feeling, it's a state, an activity. For Aristotle, without friendship, the community cannot hold together. The absence of friendship is similarly the great barrier to the flourishment of the community. Uh, analogous to Aristotle's idea of friendship, contemporary ethicists write that the virtue of solidarity manifests itself time and again as constitutive for human progress. Solidarity is the appeal to forge interpersonal relationships between and among diverse constituencies who recognize the need for one another. The call to solidarity is born out of awareness that certain social structures impede the relatedness among distinct groups of persons. It is therefore a summons to cross existing divides and to enter the framework of others who enjoy or suffer a markedly different worldview. Over the years, many American universities have notably tried to raise consciousness of its students by supporting them in their trips to Appalachia, to Haiti, to a wide variety of other outposts so that students can enter into solidarity with an entirely other constituency. Students learn from these endeavors that such solidarity is not a one-way street. They learn in these settings how to work with others on the same project, as is the case, for instance, of Habitat for Humanity. As they participate in a project, they become aware of very differing presuppositions that animate the other's worldview. Yet as they engage in such work, they find that not only do they give, but they receive. And in fact, they often return to the university from immersion experiences with the witness, I received more than I gave. In a similar way, the practice of solidarity is not based on an, any anonymous one-way act of charity. Rather, solidarity is constitutively able to function only where the differing constituencies are participative in the same projects and enter into a relationship of commitment for achieving the same end or purpose. In doing my research for this topic, I became convinced that the tenure-line faculty must enter, enter into interpersonal relationships of concern and commitment if the university is ever to resolve its unsustainable present policy of part-time adjunct faculty. If solidarity is more than a feeling, but a state, and what today we might call a practice, we could see a fairly broad range of practices that tenure-line faculty could pursue in order to develop a relation of solidarity with their adjunct faculty. Colleagues, there are four overarching strategies which can identify be identified now as being practices of solidarity. Learn the facts. Commit to exploring change. Enter into collegiality with all faculty, regardless of their status and prepare to make sacrifices. The third practice is the heart of academic solidarity, collegiality. Enter into collegiality requires a host of actions beginning with the lifting of the veil of ignorance and finding a way to recognize the adjunct faculty not as an outsider, but rather one of us. Certainly tenured faculty should advocate for true substantive changes in the contractual relations between the university and adjunct faculty but the tenured faculty need to be first collegial with their colleagues, all of them. Thank you. to Jim's talk and reflecting on his work uh, and who participated, the three of them, in our semester long reading group uh, of Jim's University Ethics. Um, so why don't you all come up and I'll introduce them each now and they'll each take a few moments uh, with some prepared statements. We have Joining us tonight, I'm especially pleased uh, to say, Daniela Ramirez, who is a recent graduate. <laughs> Daniela received her bachelor's degree from Ellen just last spring, majoring in English and minoring in Spanish. <coughs> 
She served as the president of LMU Students for Labor and Economic Justice, actively supporting the efforts to create just working conditions in solidarity with adjuncts and facility management employees. Daniela also participated in Sigma, Lambda, Gamma, and the Spanish Club. <laughs> Uh, following Daniela, we'll hear from Fred Puza, who's worked at LMU for 11 years, and who currently serves as the Marketing and Recruitment Specialist in the Graduate Division, and as a Resident Minister in Houston Hall. Fred. Fred is, in addition, uh, the President of the Staff Senate. He teaches also at LA Harbor Community College. He received his BA in theater arts from Cal State Fullerton and his master's degree in English from LDU. Following Fred, we'll hear from Elizabeth Drummond, who is an associate professor <coughs> in modern European history. Her research focuses on the German-Polish borderlands in the 19th and 20th centuries, and she teaches broadly in modern European and world history. Elizabeth is in her second year as the president of LMU's faculty senate. each of the presentations will open up uh, to the floor for comments and questions for all of our presenters. And Danielle. Cool, thank you. <clears throat> Hi everybody. Um, thank you so much Dr. Harrison. Okay, thank you. So as Dr. Harrison said, my name is Daniela. Um, as the first member in my family to attend college, to say that I had no idea what I was getting myself into is an understatement. I knew that I wanted to go to school and surround myself with a community of like-minded individuals striving to get an education, to discover themselves, and hopefully achieve a productive and meaningful life. Attending LMU alone was more than I could have possibly dreamed of, with its mission based on the Jesuit and Marymount tradition. <coughs> What I wasn't expecting was, unfortunately, a lack of community. A lack of commitment to, to the neighbor. Now, don't get me wrong, it's here. I've had the honor to meet some of the most influential, passionate, and ethically driven individuals here at LMU, among my friends, colleagues, and mentors. But for an institution that strives to produce extraordinary men and women dedicated to service and social justice, there's a deafening, deafening silence regarding the importance of ethics coming from the majority of our community. While we have students who are part of clubs like Resilience, Mecha, SLG, Sledge, service organizations, there is still a lack of university-wide commitment to ethical community. Father Keenan touches upon a, member, a number of controversial topics in his text that I was able to directly connect with our LME community here. But I want to discuss, um, I want to discuss some of these now. First, our adjunct professors. Part-time faculty endure unjust working conditions throughout our country. Although LMU is committed to social justice, students are, aren't encouraged to engage in struggles for justice within the university. I learned personally the circumstances of LMU's adjunct faculty through my involvement with Students for Labor and Economic Justice Club my sophomore year. Some of the most impactful educators that I've had at LMU were adjunct faculty, professionals who work tirelessly, many holding two to three jobs to support their families. But there is a disconnect that exists between faculty, staff, and students. Many of our professors do not know what happens in the lives of, our, of, of the students, of their students. Much like students are not aware of what happens in the lives of their, you know, their faculty, those who are educating them. Students took a stance to create awareness of the, unju the unjust working conditions of our adjunct faculty, and we fought against the university's union-busting efforts working alongside our professors. We exercised our voice, welcoming ethical community dialogue, and ultimately made positive changes. Second, 
the commodification of education. LMU leaders are making, are making decisions for our community to ensure that we have a fully functional institution. But does administration know who they are leading? Our administration is unaware of what members of the student body go through on a day-to-day -day basis. During my four years at LMU, the student body received, received an email just before the beginning of the school year stating how much tuition was increasing in an effort to maintain the quality of our academic programs and to moderate increases for continuing students. The same, um, the same disconnect that exists with our um, faculty and students exists between our administration and the general community. What does it mean to have someone attend an institution that roughly costs $50,000 a year when, when a student's uh, parents roughly earns $14,000 a year. Our administrators, our administrators aware that students like me, when I attended LMU, depend solely on federal funding and the limited number of scholarships. Or to touch upon my previous point, we have, an in, we have increasing tuition year, you know, year to year as, as we continue growing, yet we still have a number of faculty that struggle to balance their time for students and to making a livable wage. Our choices being made by our, by our administration, rooted and driven by ethical thought and dialogue. We need decision making in, that are in keeping with our mission statement and not driven by a corporate mindset. To my third point, undocumented students. With the upcoming election, the matter of undocumented students is directly impacting our community. Threats of deportation and the splitting of the families makes it absolutely crucial that the LME community support our undocumented students. Last year, students and a select number of faculty and staff united against the uh, vandalization of a mural created by an on-campus club again resilience to honor Immigration Awareness Week. The wall communicated words of love, acceptance, social justice, and the encouragement of community. All aspects that correspond with our mission statement here at LMU. It was challenging to get our university officials to speak out on the needs of our students, however. <laughs> this is an ethical issue that, in my opinion, was only addressed um, due to the attention it generated on our campus and through the media. The struggle for solidarity with undocumented students continues. Resilience and allies are currently asking our student government to honor our Jesuit and Marymount tradition by standing with all LME lines. We are asking that they engage ethically with the community. Fourth, our, facility, our facilities management and dining with workers. While at LMU, I had the privilege of getting to know many, many of the employees who work daily to make sure that our school is as beautiful and sustainable as it currently is. But as a marginalized group on our campus, many of their needs, much like their dignity, was unfortunately neglected. We saw this with the abrupt cancellation of volunteer-run computer workshops that were, that were run by dedicated staff, as camp, um, staff, as camp, staff. We saw the dismissal of workers without just cause and with disregard for their person. Our FM and dining workers are just as important as any other member um, of our community. Therefore, it is our institution's responsibility to generate an environment of ethics in which our community members are able to speak up and be heard. In his text, Father Keenan states, making ethics means making community. Making community means encouraging not only our classmates, but all our university community members to take the time to learn what it means to be a woman of color, uh, what it means to be an undocumented student at LMU, what it means to be an, ad an adjunct faculty member, what it means to be a member of the working class. True education of the whole person means encouraging community. It means feeling compassion for your neighbor. It means granting a student the ability to speak freely without the fear of retaliation. Thank you. Um, as Anna pointed out, uh, a group of us have been talking this past year about this book, about Father Keenan, so it's actually nice to meet the man behind the book today. Um, uh, as, uh, my name is Fred Puza, uh, and I was asked to keep it brief tonight, and I'm going to respect that wish, uh, but not because I don't have anything to say. <laughs> but I'm responding on behalf of the voices of staff members, and one thing that is glaringly missing 
And the book is Ethics Related to Staff Members. Uh, this is no fault of Father Keenan. Uh, there simply has been little to no research done in this area. So how can anyone write about something that does not exist yet? So my hope is that as more people in higher education catch on to this valuable and essential theme of university ethics, that more research will be done to one of the largest blocks of employees that a university employs, which goes largely uh, ignored. Uh, so since there is limited research, I'll speak for my observations at LMU. I know there are similar and consistent themes at other universities. Um, as staff senate president, I've been re repeatedly reminded that staff senate and, set, uh, and staff are not part of the shared governments at the university. I respect and understand that uh, idea uh, to a certain degree. On one hand, uh, many universities do not have such organized functioning staff senate. Um, and there are things that staff should not be a part of, including possibly safeguarding academic freedom, faculty rights, and faculty roles. Uh, but as the university moves forward, and will undoubtedly face new challenges, such as operating with limited resources, the need for imaginative and collaborative uh, curricular, co-curricular, and experiential programs and initiatives, not only um, not including staff in the decision-making process may present more roadblocks than avenues to success. Um, and not only the university as is, but as we imagine the possibilities of what the university can be, Simple and complex solutions may be lost when staff members aren't included in that conversation. I don't like the argument that there's just, that's just not how things are done at uh, different universities um, or universities in general. If we truly want to be innovative and leaders in higher education that requires bold decisions and to do things that, uh, that need to be done given our unique identity, not following the lead of others. Uh, before I go any further, uh, I want to make it clear that I don't pretend to know the answers to these questions, and I want to be very clear that I'm not advocating that Staff Senate becomes part of uh, shared governance right away either. Um, I just have the pleasure of being critical of the issues that I see, um, and other people get the pleasure of solving those issues. Um, <laughs> as, I, um, as I mentioned, <laughs> there's a reasonable about, amount of literature about the ethics of uh, you know, faculty, students, uh, athletics, um, that Father Keenan mentioned, but there's limited amount about staff members. This is odd considering that staff members have arguably the most interactions with students uh, through counseling, student clubs, organizations, housing, athletic, spiritual groups, and on. Um, at a university of, uh, like LMU that employs 2,000 employees, about 70% are staff members. Um, all this means that staff members have unique insight into the students, into the university, and can offer a lot of insight into the decision-making process. Staff members are on the front lines. Uh, while faculty certainly have a unique relationship with students, they cannot see and hear the things that staff members can. Um, and the other top decision makers, senior administration, board of trustees, and regent, regents have limited exposure to students. Um, if the crux of our mission is to serve students, it's reasonable to say that not giving staff members a voice cuts off a vital entry point that can truly benefit the university at large. It shouldn't be the only voice, but the voice should somehow be incorporated. Um, now I want to pivot to three years of opportunity in regards to ethical leadership at LMU. A lot of this comes from my experience, again, um, but the, there are similar concerns from colleagues at other um, institutions of higher education. Um, and of course, these are meant to be conversation starters, and more research needs to be done. But first is the, the power of the supervisor. Um, as staff senate president, I get to hear uh, grievances about supervisors. Some of the criticism is le legitimate and others is not. Um, but it seems like supervisors have a lot of unchecked power at their discretion. discretion. For example, there are many HR policies that provide clarity about job-related issues. But at the end, um, it says that it's ultimately up to the discretion of the supervisor. This can lead to the negative effect of creating a hostile environment. Um, staff, some staff members report not feeling comfortable reporting um, issues of ethics or unfair treatment by their, um, by their supervisor in fear of retaliation. Um, and it may feel especially frustrating when they see others receiving benefits um, from a culture based on favoritism rather than a bare, merit, um, standardized merit system. Supervisors sometimes receive little training in how to be a supervisor. We need to ensure that all staff members are treated equally across the board. We can't privilege some employees and not others. Uh, if we call our students to become ethical leaders in the world, in corporations, and businesses, and other institutions of higher education, we need to practice that too 
here um, to model to our students. Um, second is communication and transparency. Uh, many of our issues and problems can be easily solved if everyone is made aware of issues and problems. Um, now I know this is easier said than done at working communications, and I know a lot of times information is indeed communicated, um, and people just don't read. Um, however, there are cases where there is no formal communication, um, where decisions are made, such as terminating employees, or important policies are updated related to staff and employees, without explanation or dialogue with the community at large. Um, third, I think that uh, this absence of staff and the shared conversation about the university plays out in many ways. For example, in negative attitudes about staff members. I'm on the implicit bias committee at LMU, um, and I've heard stories um, of bias based on educational, ba educational background um, and employment. So senior level staff members who may have, or may or may not have equivalent um, educational background um, have been regularly dismissed and ignored during committee meetings uh, with faculty members. Again, the university misses out on these valuable contributions um, from its members doing work on the front lines, sidelines, and behind the scenes. Um, lastly, I just think that it was a great um, uh, opportunity to be part of this reading group. It's a valuable exercise for people from all over the university to engage critically about how the university is run and ways we can improve and become the best version of ourselves. Thank you. Uh, namely, we want people with expertise, 
uh, to be making decisions through collaborative consensus building processes based on peer review. That doesn't mean the faculty alone, but the faculty in concert with administrators and with staff. Um, so for example, we tend to see this as kind of a given when we think about hospitals, right? The idea that we, at least I, want doctors making medical decisions, um, including about standards of care, who make practice, and so on. But it seems to me that we want to have that sort of model in the university as well. And even more than that, and I think this is maybe gets at some of these issues of ethics, um, and forgive some of my idealism here, uh, I think that this type of governance structure is also part and parcel of how the university models democracy and good citizenship as a whole. Um, as we know, perhaps more than ever from this rather ugly presidential campaign, democracy is messy, it can be ugly, it can be conflict prone, uh, but the values of inclusion, transparency, thoughtful deliberation, consensus building, appeals to reason are the values of civil society. Um, that doesn't mean that people will always like the result, or that there will always, or that people will always feel that their voices have been adequately heard. But engaging in respectful and civil debate, and following reasonable processes, and taking an active part in the university. Uh, in standing in solidarity with each other, we also model civil society and citizenship for our students, just as we seek to model the intellectual life. And I think that's a really important part of what we do outside the classroom. I also think it helps establish the structures and mechanisms through which we can then address other ethical concerns, right? So in which the members of the community have a voice in the governance of that community. Uh, and that brings me to one of the issues, as my second point, that's been discussed quite a bit this evening, um, and that is the universities, the modern universities, the corporate universities approach to faculty staffing, um, as Jim and Daniela and really everyone in higher education and higher education press has pointed out, uh, we're facing the phenomenon of the objectification of the university, where universities are increasingly reliant, and this is true at LMU as well, on contingent, especially part-time faculty. At research institutions, I would also add that this includes relying on graduate students as teaching labor as well. Uh, this is part of broader trends, um, the gig economy that people talk about a lot. Uh, so as you take your Uber home, think of your adjunct professor. Um, <laughs> sorry? Prescribed to Uber. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, how we treat part-time faculty, uh, even, so, Contingent faculty in general, but especially part-time faculty, is really, I think, the most pressing ethical one of the most pressing ethical challenges for the university. So I want to begin there. Um, for me, there is no question that the use of part-time labor is almost always an inherently exploitative practice. It's designed to offer quality education, and given the passion and dedication of our part-time faculty, there's no question that it's a quality education but to offer quality education on the cheap, to pay lower wages, to avoid having to offer benefits, to sidestep handbook uh, structures that provide protections to faculty, especially in the form of tenure against dismissal, uh, to allow part-time faculty to have a substantive voice in the university. Uh, they simply, it's, even when they have a space for it through structures, uh, they are so vulnerable that the degree to which they can actually take advantage of that space is really questionable. Um, I would argue that part of the culpability uh, in the objectification of the university, so we tend to blame it on administrators, and, and they bear a lot of the blame, um, but part of the culpability is also uh, our one institutions with graduate programs. Uh, faculty there enjoy their low teaching loads that enable them to do regular scholarship, um, they teach graduate seminars, but not less likely to teach undergraduate seminars. That means that they're also admitting far too many graduate students for the market to handle and producing far too many PhDs for the market to handle. It creates a glut of PhDs uh, that creates a pool for adjunct labor. Um, and it also means that they then have to have adjunct labor or their own graduate students providing part of, part of the labor at their own universities. That's not the only part of what's going on with the gentrification of the university, um, but I do think it's a part of it. Um, at LMU, we've been working to address uh, the concerns of part-time faculty. 
uh, through a variety of working groups that various people, including I, have been involved in, uh, and then also through the Senate. It's always a slow process because universities do turn slowly. Uh, Part-time faculty do have representation in the Faculty Senate, uh, where they are full voting members. Uh, they have representation in some school and college level governance bodies. Uh, they have representation on some committees. One of the things we've worked very hard to do is to make sure that for that service they are compensated. Uh, it is uh, in addition to their regular contractual duties, so we want to make sure that they're not offering <coughs> free labor, but rather that they are compensated for that labor. Uh, the university now makes health insurance available to some part-time faculty, those who teach two sections uh, in, in each semester, so who consistently teach two sections. Uh, those also tend to be some of our faculty who are most likely to be cobbling together lots of different sections at 25 different universities. Uh, we're working to create a system of ranks so that we can acknowledge and reward seniority, expertise, excellence, commitment to the university. The idea here is that promotion will come with uh, better pay, um, but also other privileges, uh, including possibility for multi-year, well, this is one of the things that we're talking about, multi-year contracts, professional development funds, uh, and the like. We have worked to try to standardize hiring and evaluation practices, and as much as possible, we're trying to use language that's consistent across different faculty categories, uh, including in the articulation of rights and responsibilities, duties, and um, privileges. Uh, so addressing the concerns of part-time faculty is first and foremost about treating employees as valued members and colleagues in our community, uh, about adopting policies that recognize the dignity of their work, uh, not just in word, but also in deed, and that's why the economic issues are so important. Um, it's part of helping our part-time faculty to flourish, uh, which is also, by the way, better for our students and what we do as a university. Um, as a postscript, I just want to say, I, and I do have one more point, if you leave me four more minutes, is that okay? Um, I will. As a postscript to this, I will say that I find the, the efforts of universities, and I'm looking at you, Manhattan, Seattle, Duquesne, to challenge unionization, ground, unionization efforts on the grounds of religious freedom, particularly odious. It strikes me as a very cynical use of religion to defend um, unethical economic practices, business practices. Um, so the last thing I'll say is that I think that um, there are a variety of ways, and this is my third point about how universities ought, to, as institutions, to act more ethically in a variety of different areas. Um, I'd just like to point out one model that I think helps us do it. Um, I went to Georgetown, uh, and so I think there are a lot of good things that Georgetown has done, the Just Employment Policy, uh, the student group Unsung Heroes, but I actually want to focus on Georgetown's efforts around slavery the Working Group for Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation, and its recommendations. Maybe it's because I'm a historian, um, but I'm particularly struck at how Georgetown has rooted, rooted its engagement with questions of justice in the present in a deep commitment to working through of the past. Um, and it's rooted its response in both that history and in its Catholic identity, and I think that's a good model for how we think about other issues that confront the university. So how we think about university investment practices and whether we ought to divest from fossil fuels um, or private prisons. How we think about how we can honor the dignity of our staff and their labor and also empower them. How we treat our students, how we engage student activists, whether it's Black Lives Matter or Latino Latino students, LGBT students. How we talk about free speech in a way that truly respects the free speech of students rather than belittling them for demanding um, certain things. How we deal with sexual assault in a way that empowers our students rather than is primarily about protecting the institution. How we deal with undocumented students and whether we offer sanctuary from them and protect, sanctuary to them and protection from legal action. And I think for the student side of things, most importantly, how we solve the accessibility challenge that Daniela talked about. Um, the kind of education we do at LMU is a really expensive, wildly expensive form of education for a whole lot of reasons. Um, but how do we balance paying for such things, particularly at a tuition-dependent institution, with those concerns about accessibility? So if the, adjunct, the issue of adjunct faculty is perhaps the most pressing concern for the faculty side of things, I think the issue of accessibility might be, will be the most pressing concern on the student side of things. I'll stop there. Sorry. <laughs>
Jim to respond to the respondents. However, if I may turn to the audience. Yeah. Uh, given the limited amount of time we have, uh, if that's okay with you. Yeah. And ask, I uh, invite you all uh, to, to ask questions and or to make observations about the state of the university, LMU, uh, and or the uh, presentations you've all heard tonight. Uh, I want to pick up on, on one of the comments that you made, Daniela, uh, where you pointed out that we had begun the, um, uh, the uh, computer literacy classes, and the library actually, our library, thank you, um, has been winning awards. The staff that was doing this has been winning awards and speaking about it and writing about it and uh, being singled out for how innovative, innovative our program was because we were working with our custodial workers and our gar groundskeepers. And then it was stopped because they will not be allowed to have time during their work day for this, which had been what was allowed. And I, I you know, we heard about staff and, and, and faculty and adjuncts and the, some of the student concerns, but our worker community is really another class in, in a way that is, is not describable to the rest of us. They are isolated by language, they are isolated by educational uh, attainment, they're isolated by the kinds of work hours that they keep, and you're very familiar with this, Daniela. Um, so um, I, I, I know I'm Fred, that uh, there's a, a, um, a proposal right now to uh, ask the university to provide um, uh, development hours for uh, workers, because they're not, they're not allowed to be on committees, they can't uh, use any other time for any professional development. They're not given uh, retreats or any of the kinds of things that we are given, and most of them can't afford to do it after their work hours, but many of them have two jobs. Um, so um, what could we do? Because I know that this has been brought up to the staff senate. Uh, what could the university community do to support this, to, to demand of the university that we don't create this, this really um, uh, completely disenfranchised class that we don't continue to have this disenfranchised class of, of, uh, of workers on our campus. Um, go individually. <coughs> well, I think, um, thank you for bringing that up, yeah. Uh, Staff Senate worked really hard this past year to get someone from uh, facilities maintenance on Staff Senate to represent the, the to have a voice for who is not blue or who is not white collar. So, um, so we really worked hard for that to happen. We, as you mentioned, there is a proposal for a guaranteed 15 hours per year to get training. Um, most staff members. Um, some staff members, have, majority of staff members have the opportunity to do professional development, to take computer literacy courses, to take, to advance in whatever, um, uh, whatever their, you know, their job is. But also it's a, a issue of equity as far as um, access to emails, to communication that people receive from the university forms. Um, so we want to make sure that um, if that communication is coming out, um, that they can, they can access it. Um, and that it's in a language that they'll understand. Um, so if we're hiring um, them, um, then we need to make sure we are taking care of them. That's an essential part of the university, and so that's why Staff Senate is out of it behind moving this proposal forward. Um, it's a slow process, unfortunately, but um, we are working on it. So, but I think, yeah, as far as staff, like, yeah, coming together um, and, you know, getting I think as, we, as the proposal moves forward, then getting letters of support and other people to support and join in on it. So it's not just one body, but multiple. Other uh, questions or observations? follow up on what you just said. Um, okay. uh, I, I, I have 
three basic fundamental recommendations. First is um, we need to default less to the vertical accountability model. This is constantly happening. Somebody is made a higher level of administrator. The, de the, the chair of the department has more dean-like uh, 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 roles and responsibilities. Uh, we, I see uh, at my university, we just made the head of campus ministry a uh, vice president. We, we see a variety of roles happening in which we, we keep escalating the, the, the ceiling um, in which we make vertical accountability to occur more and more. Um, I had written down, um, Elizabeth, uh, and I actually, we're hosting a conference at Boston College from April 5th to 7th on university ethics. And we're concluding it with three models of positive um, steps that have been taken. The first is we have a man named Tim Balliott coming from Penn State after Penn, one of the great things is when you really make a mess, you become a genius at resolving it. And so Penn State has created for the first time a university ethics officer. He wrote to me when he saw my book to tell me that he has this job, and they've given him a great deal of authority to look at different practices at that university. There is no such thing. So I thought that, so he's coming to speak. The second person we have is the executive director of Take Back the Night. Throughout my book, I argue that the first introduction of ethics on the campus was by Take Back the Night. That was a group of people. That was not a person. When, when the White House came out with their white paper about sexual assault on campuses, many women thought, who were undergraduates, look what we did. That is a movement that's been going on for 55 years. And that's where ethics entered the campus. It actually entered the campus through women. Not for nothing, but sitting here, I counted 32 women and 18 men. This is not a surprise for me. I mean, it was the same relationality, uh, same proportionality earlier when it was a fuller audience. There's something about an academy in which there are very few women administrators, but the people who show up at the meetings are the women. There's something that take back the night is really the first instantiation of that. So we wanted, we actually have in our program, we have Judith Jenkins Scott. Uh, coming to speak, for she was the president of Wheelock, just to talk about women as stakeholders at a university. But the second point, this first point is, we need to default less to these models of vertical accountability and more to collegial modes of proceeding. So the second speaker is about to take back tonight. The third is a member of the Slavery, Memory, and Reconciliation from Georgetown University. Remember that Georgetown University got into trouble because one man, the president, made a singular decision about selling these, uh, these human beings. That, that act of selling these human beings um, was really rather disturbing, but it was by, done by one person. How did this all happen at, at Georgetown now? It's being responded and resolved by a group of people exercising a horizontal accountability. And, and this is my second point, they did research. Somebody in the history department decided to study what were the different people who were sold. The issue about Georgetown is they had the names of the 257 men and women who were sold. And so a historian studied that. How many faculty study the practices of their university? I, I did a study in, in, in my book. I mentioned it on one page. I checked the number of medical ethics books. We had something like 2,500 <coughs> medical ethics books. We had about, um, uh, about 800 nursing ethics books. We had about, um, uh, I don't know, about 1,000 business ethics books. We had about 400 legal ethics books. Now, who wrote those books? Faculty. There is not one book on the university. There is a, about 20 books on faculty, but they, only, they don't even talk about adjunct faculty. They only talk about tenure track. We, faculty, are not examining the institution we work in. At least in the church, members of the church scrutinize their church. But we don't do that research. I have a woman right now, Megan McCabe. She's doing great culture in the university as a dissertation. 
these dissertations <coughs> need to be done. Just as that historian decided to know the background of those 257 slaves that Georgetown sold, that research is constitutive of the progress that we need to do. So the first point, try to, we need to have more collegial modes of proceeding and fewer uh, defaulting to this vertical accountability. And the third and final point is to promote community. That's ethics. Ethics is about promoting community. It's about including and not excluding. It's about engaging and not, and not leaving out. And the university somehow manages in its corporate structure and in its vocational mode of proceeding to act alone. And this notion of solidarity, I think, is really rather important. I, when I took over, I, I run an institute. It's called the Jesuit Institute. It's a very well-funded institute. Everybody would love to have my, my operational budget. Deans would. Um, but it was a gift from the Jesuit community 27 years ago. It has been running um, seminars on faith and culture. We have one right now on economic inequity, one on sustainability, one on compassion and neurobiology, and we have a fourth, which is on university ethics. The university ethics seminar was started when I decided for the first time to invite adjunct faculty to form their own seminar. I invited 18 professors of practice to come together to discuss things just on faith and culture. It was a wild shot. It was incredible. It's the best seminar we have going at the Institute because these are people who've been teaching there for 15 years who knew of one another, but there was never an occasion for them to meet one another. And it became like this you know, love fest for every month that we met, and also a convention session, uh, because people were able to talk across the world about what they were doing <coughs> And, and, and they did it for about six months. And then they said, now let's roll up our sleeves and do something. And they said, we want to read your book. So this, you had your seminar here, we had our seminar there. And it's been, we have this big conference. We have 19 major speakers coming. We have Taylor Branch, who wrote on Martin Luther King and civil rights, and then now has written the book on university um, sports. We have Ruth Simmons, who was the president of Brown when the entire slavery question was brought to her, and she was the first African-American um, woman president of an Ivy school. But we have a, a host of other people, like Take Back the Night and the rest. And, and that's also coming from people who do not dedicate their lives to research, but they do dedicate their lives to the university, and they're incorporated. So we're launching two more, two more and this is where I'll conclude on, we're launching two more seminars uh, next semester. The first is it's for administrative staff. Um, I've asked my associate director um, that she can help me, Tony Ross, to set this all up. And we will have, across the board, we will invite about 16 uh, staff administrators to just come together. And I expect for the first six months, they'll be kvetching about all sorts of different things and about what, do you, what does your department do? What does your chair like? I heard about that. but. <laughs> and this sharing that happens, that that's a community building enterprise. But after that, I have no idea what they'll come up with. But that possibility is what happens when you build community. Community moves ethically. No community, you don't move ethically. And the last is, we're setting up one, I talked to Terry Devineau. Terry Devineau is um, in charge of like a lot of things at the university. But he basically works with the custodial staff, the dining services, he works with uh, facilities, and he's now, he and I are going to pull together a seminar of this constituency. And they'll be meeting on a monthly basis, having dinner, kvetching, and then coming up with their own way of designing. I had originally thought, why don't I get these constituencies from custodial staff and dining service and get them into the sustainability project, or to get people from the administrative staff and all. They'll not be comfortable sitting at the table with the faculty, especially with the tenure-track faculty. Not yet. But if they get around that table often enough, that they're familiar with that table, next year, they'll be able to speak. There has to be ways that we attend deliberately with our own intentionality, with the same rigor we bring to a syllabus, the same rigor we bring to figuring out which article we should read, the same research that we try to do. We need to do it about the university. 
You may have a desire to ask me a question to solve something. I'm just broaching the question. That's what this is about, broaching a question. Is there a connection among all the different scandals that occur at American universities across it that ask us, why is it that we have all these books on medical ethics, all these books on um, nursing ethics, legal ethics, business ethics, sexual ethics, but nothing, nothing about where we're employed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, for all your insights and also for the suggestions about good practices that you've left us with. I want to thank you also the panelists and uh, uh, I would like to mention the Academic US that has co-sponsored this event, uh, specifically the BCLA Dean's Office, the Jesuit Community, the Academy for Catholic Thought and Imagination, Catholic Studies, uh, CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice, and last but not least, the Departments of Philosophy and Theological Studies. Um, a word of thank also to the staff of the Bioethics Institute, Eden Olivieri and uh, <laughs> uh, the copy of Jim's book is on sale outside uh, in the uh, atrium. And because the word friendship and of course community was uh, mentioned before, everyone is, in, is invited, is welcome to enjoy uh, the reception outside, let's see how many women and how many men stay. <laughs> Thank you and good night.